book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 3 is a familiar verse to many of us. It encapsulates our gratefulness for being a part of a family of churches, not being an independent, isolated church in that sense. We are very grateful for friends. Paul says to the Philippian church, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We have a guest speaker this morning. His name is Jason Hansen. He's a dear friend of mine. He comes to us from Gilbert, Arizona. And he comes to us, first of all, because he has a teaching gift, and you're going to benefit from that this morning as he opens up God's word to us. But the other specific reason that he's here is because he is a member of the pastoral team of Sovereign Grace Church of Gilbert. And we've made it a, a practice to seek to invite members of that pastoral team out with some regularity uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we want to express uh, somehow our gratefulness as a church for our existence as a church. <laughs> um, that church sent a group of people, including myself, uh, my family, dear friends, they invested those people into this community for the launching of this church. This church wasn't uh, self-existent. It didn't kind of crop up out of nothing. Uh, it came because people sacrificed. And that's how churches are built. Churches are planted when people sacrifice. And Sovereign Grace Church of Gilbert sacrificed people and resources, leaders, so that there could be a church right here preaching the gospel this morning and all the Sundays that we're here reaching out to this community. And so we wanted Jason to come partially just so we could express and experience our, our gratefulness for those who sacrifice so that we could enjoy a church together. Uh, the other reason that we wanted to have Jason here is so that we can be envisioned for the future because there will come a day when it will be our opportunity to sacrifice for the sake of a church plant. We don't know when that day will come exactly. Uh, we want to do all we can even before a church plant comes to serve other churches and to send money towards church planting, but there will come a day when we will send out a group or a person or a team or a pastor to plant a church somewhere. And having men in from this team, it, it reminds us as a church that one day it will be our opportunity to fall in the footsteps of those who have gone before us, to, to send, to go, to invest, to pray, to sacrifice, to give, so that churches can be built, so that other communities can experience the preaching of the gospel. On a personal note, uh, Jason Hansen uh, is a dear friend. He is a faithful friend, and he is a wise pastor. Jason serves in a host of different roles at Sovereign Grace Church. He serves overlooking or overseeing the youth ministry. He serves with preaching regularly. He serves in providing leadership on the staff there at the church. He, he does a, a number of different responsibilities in support of Rich Richardson, who is the senior pastor there. And he has uh, been, to me, a, a friend that has encouraged me over the years, had built me up in the gospel, has reminded me of God's faithfulness and God's work. I remember when Jason came back from the pastor's college uh, now seven years ago, uh, he came at a time when our church was experiencing suffering and difficulty, and he came bringing a sense of faith and encouragement and enthusiasm in a moment when myself and our pastoral team uh, desperately needed that faith and enthusiasm and encouragement. And my hope was that he could bring that same faith and enthusiasm and encouragement uh, into this season, which is not a season of suffering, but into this season in our church as well. He's preaching from Romans this morning. And the reason he's preaching from Romans chapter 3 is that our church is called to be a gospel-centered church. But the only way we can be gospel-centered is if we center ourselves and our thinking and our affections and our love on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I asked Jason, we asked Jason, would, would you preach to us the center of that gospel so that we can be centered on it, so that we can love it more deeply, so we can be more informed of what it means. And so I, I want to invite you this morning to open your mind and your heart, even though this gospel news is going to be familiar, that we would be freshly inspired by what is the center of our theology this morning. So let's welcome Jason as he comes to speak to us this morning. Appreciate it. 
Well, good morning. It's, it's fun to be here with you guys. There's, uh, there's something in the preaching, teaching, I guess, if you will, as they teach you to preach, how to preach. Uh, they say, don't do something. And the thing that they say not to do is to do two introductions. And just forgive me because I'm going to do two introductions this morning. I have an introduction for my sermon, but I want to put that on pause for just a moment because I wanted to just take a, a second and... Um, greet you all from the Gilbert Church. There is um, greetings coming from the pastoral team that wanted to wanted me to uh, just say thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this church. Thank you for being a church in Round Rock, Texas. Um, and the, all the pastors on the team are, are excited for you to be here. They're excited. They wish they could all be here. They've communicated that to me. Uh, also, people in the church who I had talked to before I came and knew I was coming, um, also wanted me to pass along their greetings to you and their desire to be here. And at some point, I think you've probably experienced some of them coming um, because there are family members here who, uh, who <laughs> are in this church, and I know a number of them have come over. Others wish they could be here as well. And so um, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to just communicate is my joy in coming. And, and there's three main reasons why um, I'm, I'm joyful. It's fun to be here, and it's fun to be able to preach. The first one is just seeing some familiar faces. There's a number of you who I, I've known for a long time, and it's, it's really fun to be here. It's fun to see you. Um, it's fun to greet you. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, a friend of mine who lives in this area, is not a part of this church is here, his name is Eric, and um, it's fun to see him and his wife Wendy. And in fact, if you want to uh, get stories about me living in a trailer park and how much of an idiot I was back in those days, uh, Eric would be the one to talk to. He was around for that time period, and he'd be able to share with you those things. It's fun to see them. It's fun to see you from Gilbert, the people that have come part of this, uh, come here from Gilbert on this church plant. It's just, it's, it's one of the things I was looking forward to, to seeing all of you. The, the second thing, uh, the second reason that I'm excited about it is to see new faces, because one of the reasons why we planted or at least we're a part of, we didn't plant this church, we sent out the team that planted this church. One of the reasons why we did that was because we wanted a church to exist here, and we wanted you to experience John's care and his preaching gift and the other pastors that are going to be here. Now, Aaron's been effective that way as well, and others. And so the fact that there are new faces here is encouraging to me. Um, that is what we prayed for when we sent the team out, and, and that is what God has been faithful to do, and so I'm grateful to see you. And, and the, third, <clears throat> the third reason is just because of my friendship with John. And John has been a, as he said about me, he has been to me a faithful friend. And, and it's been years of friendship. The first time I met John, um, I was working at the time in, in real estate, trying to figure out when I was going to be a pastor, and I was biding my time. We had just had our first daughter, Abby, and the, the wash of sleeplessness was over me, and I was driving around with John trying to help him look for houses in pretty much like the neighborhood really close to my own, and I couldn't figure out where I was. I remember trying to pull out of the neighborhood, and I just said, Bro, I don't know where I, I have no idea where I am right now. <laughs> do, where do I go? Do I go right? I mean, he's does, he just moved to Phoenix. You know, he's like, I think you go right. And so, <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Let's go right. No, we go right. Um, from that moment on, um, there have been laughs and joys and serious moments. And it's John, as you know, if you've experienced John's friendship and his care, you know what a friend he is and how caring he is. So, John, I'm, I'm grateful to be here, man. Thanks for asking me to come. So with that note, my first introduction is over, and now I will start the sermon. So if you could open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We're going to read from verse 21, but we will spend most of our time on 23 through 26. There are a number of different kinds of passages of Scripture. All of them feed our souls. Some are lighter meals. You know, it's, it's like going to a place that serves salad and it's still good for you. Some of them are like going to the steakhouse and you just indulge and it is very filling. This would be the latter. This section of scripture would be that second portion. 
In fact, Martin Luther said of these verses that these verses are the chief point of the whole Bible. The chief point of the whole Bible. And my prayer this morning is that these verses, this truths found in these verses that can become so familiar to us, would, would burst out of the page freshly for you. I pray that these would, as I've been praying about this, I pray that these would, would come off the page in a new way this morning to once again freshly invigorate our hearts to run our race with endurance and joy and gladness. So that is my prayer this morning. And to that end, let me pray. Father, I, I do pray this morning as we look at these passages of Scripture, as we open these up, that you would be active among us in our hearts. Lord, I pray for every single man and woman in this room, that we would all, as we open the word and, and take a look at it and unpack it a little bit, that we would be aware again of amazing grace. And that it would, in fa it would affect not just our hearts this morning, but also tomorrow morning and the mornings next week and the weeks following, that it would be a, just a continual growing experience as we understand the truths that are that are coming off of the pages here in Romans and then would it flood into every other portion of scripture in our hearts do that work this morning we pray and we ask in Jesus name amen the first time that i read uh, the count of monte cristo was i was a senior in high school and that book uh, opened my eyes to the wonder of good classic literature. Now, it's one thing to read, like I, I'd been reading things, you know, you read Amelia Bedelia, it's a certain kind of literature, right? I mean, you're kind of like, this is, I guess, this is kind of, it's true, and, you know, this is good for a certain age group. Um, th that had been my experience, essentially, up until that point. I'd been like, Amelia Bedelia is no good. I mean, it's, it is, works for my, my kids, but you know, if it didn't work for me when I was a senior in high school. I read The Count of Monte Cristo because I was forced to. I had to read it because that was the class. It was, you got to read this book. It's like, great, another novel. I had to read this. I started reading it, and I realized this is a great story. <laughs> It is a great, I read that book five times before I read any other book. I just thought, I got to read this again. This is, the, this is the only book I can read, apparently, because this is a great story. No, nothing, it's this plot is about Edmund Dantes, who's betrayed, and then he's trying to figure out what does redemption look like, and he's trying to go back, and he's trying to understand these things, betrayal, and murder, and revenge, and dashed hopes, and dreams, and failures, and villains, and heroes, and you're trying to get, it is a great story. But at its heart, one of the reasons why it's such a great story, at its heart, at the, the crux of the matter, is that it's a story of, of love. It's a love story about redemption. At, at the crux of it, when you get to the, it contains all these other things, but in the, in the moment, it is a love story of redemption. And I remember thinking that if all stories were like this story and had written this way, that I would actually enjoy reading. This is, be, this is great. What a great story. There's something about good stories. Good stories that captivate us, that draw us in, that help us to see the glory of, well, this is amazing. Good stories do that for us. And if we read our Bibles correctly, if we see our Bible rightly, if we put it together in the right way, we understand that the Bible is one storyline. It is one great storyline, and it is the best of stories, and it's true. It is told from front to back. It contains all sorts of things. It contains, it contains betrayal and murder and revenge and dashed hopes and dreams and failures and villains and heroes. But, but it is one story at its core. It's a story. It's a love story of redemption. The greatest of stories. It's a story about one hero. One hero who is working continuously to restore the relationship that, that he once had with the ones that he loves. You see, we can't read our Bibles, the story of the Bible, as if there are many heroes, because there are not. 
There are not many heroes in the Bible. There is only one. And Paul's intent in the book of Romans, Paul's point, his, his overarching desire in this book is to tell this story from a different perspective. See, on the one hand, we can, we can begin in Genesis and we can begin reading through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges. And we walk all the way through and we get to the cross and then we go from the cross and we realize it is a story of redemption, a love story of redemption. We can read it that way in a chronological order and get that. But Paul wants us to grasp the same story of redemption from a different perspective. He, he wants us to see this, we turn a little bit and see it of the perspective of our own hearts. What does this story do? How does it play itself out in our hearts? He, he's taking pains in this whole book, the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, to ensure that we don't miss the wonder and the glory of the story as it plays out in our lives and the eternity of our souls, the reality of what happens to us. Who are we? What can we become in Christ? How do we think through these things? It's really a simple premise. We need help, and there's only one help for us. That is the story of Romans. That is the story of the Bible. So, let's read these verses. I'm going to begin in verse 21, and we'll finish in verse 26, and hear the story freshly. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, this most important story and what we're going to draw out of these verses is two main plot points. Two main points of this story. There is, Paul gives us a sober reminder to remember who we are, and he gives us a spectacular revelation to remind us of Christ. So first, we have a sober reminder. Chapters 1 through 3 of Romans paints a bleak picture. It's, a, it's this bleak picture of our standing of who we are before God. Paul, Paul wants us to know and wants us to know fully and with confidence that every single person who has ever lived has sinned and therefore has absolutely no hope before God. There is no hope for mankind in and of themselves. There, there is nothing that mankind can do. If nothing happens in the power and strength of man and woman, then the end for every single person that has ever lived is judgment by God's wrath. That is the, that is the picture of Romans chapters 1 through 3. And, and he seems, in verse 21, to make a shift. If you take a look at that, he says, but now, but now, which is a shift. Now, this is true. We are all under the wrath of God, but now... And he moves on. He, he starts talking about, about other things about Jesus and manifested apart from the law and righteousness. He starts moving on. But before he really moves on, before he actually gets to the crux of this matter of the goodness of the gospel, he offers this sober reminder by summing up chapters 1 through 3 in verse 23. For there is no distinction, meaning that meaning that man, woman, child, doesn't matter what race you are, there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person has sinned. All have sinned. Nobody is immune. Everyone is accountable. Verse 23, I guess we could say, is like the Cliff's Notes version of chapters 1 through 3. It is a simple summary of what he's just said in chapters 1 through 3. Everybody has sinned. You can't attain to the glory of God because of sin. 
In fact, maybe a more accurate way to read this verse or to understand this verse is all have sinned and are continually falling short of the glory of God with no chance to ever not fall short of the glory of God. It is total in its scope. We, we, we preached in Gilbert through the book of Romans. We're actually in Romans chapter 13 this morning. Rich is preaching that this morning. And it is bleak preaching through chapters 1 through 3. I, halfway through, as we're preaching through this, we just thought, man, it's going to be good to get to the end of, of Romans chapter 3 because it is dark. And I remember getting to the end of this section and we get to verse 21 and thinking, all right, we're moving on. And then verse 23 hits and we, it was like, oh man, we got to go back. We just preached this, the Cliff Notes version. We, we just preached this. We got we to preach it again. It's almost like we're saying, Paul, I, I get it. Okay, move on. You are killing me. Here's the thing. We don't really get it. We don't really get it. Paul wants us to hear again. No, you don't get it. If you think you understand your desperation, if you think you understand your need, if you think you understand how bad it is, you don't. Listen, if you're like me, we can be tempted. We think about a story. We can be tempted to think of our desperate hopelessness as simply simple helplessness. It's really desperate hopelessness is where we are. But we can somewhat, we can sanitize that a little bit and just think we're just simply helpless. Like we, we think about the old stories and we're the damsel in distress up in the tower and we're, oh, just somebody, you know, the hero needs to come save me. I did nothing wrong and I need to just be saved. I can't wait. We're just waiting. That's who we think we are. We're not. We're, we're the enemies who are trying to destroy the hero. We are active in the story. We are those who are enemies of God, as we're told. We, we, we've tried to destroy him, and Paul doesn't want us to move on too quickly. You have sinned. I have sinned. You have fallen short of the glory of God. I have fallen short of the glory of God. You are hopeless. I am hopeless. You are desperate. I am desperate. You are needy. I am needy. It is really bad. From the standpoint of just who we are, it is bleak, it is stark. On our own, on your own, you are rightly under God's wrath and God's judgment because you and I have sinned. And therefore, what should be rightly done is that there should be a swift judgment against us because of our guilt. That, that is what should take place. We have sinned. We are continually falling short of the glory of God. And if the hero's salvation for us and of us is going to make the impact that it actually should make, we have to grasp this. We have to understand this truth. The sin that you committed this morning is a reminder that on your own you are falling short of the glory of God. The sin that you committed last week should be a reminder that you are falling short of the glory of God. The sin that you will commit this afternoon should be a reminder that you are falling short of the glory of God. And if there was no hero to save you, you would be justly deserving of God's wrath. That is where we stand. That is who we are in and of ourselves. And the idea of justice is extraordinarily important in these verses. Seven times in these six verses, from 21 to 26, Paul uses the root word for justice. It can be translated righteousness if you see it. Some are nouns, righteousness. Some are verbs, justified. And one is an adjective, just. Now, I wanted you to see this because, because it, it makes more sense if we can look at the words for, for maybe just using the same word in there to what Paul is trying to help us to understand. You can see this. If you look at behind you, I think it's up there. Verse 21, but now the justice of God has been manifested. Verse 22, the justice of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 24, and are justified by his grace. Verse 25, this was to show God's justice. Verse 26, it was to show his justice at the present time so that he may, might be just and the justifier. Seven times in, verse, in these six verses, Paul uses this word justice. 
It is an important point for us to grasp in these short verses. Paul wants us to get this truth. God is just. God is just. Justice must always be the end result of anything that happens in God's economy. It has to be that way. There must be no accusation of him being unjust. Because he is not unjust, he is just, and you and I are guilty of sinning against this just God, and therefore justice for you and me must result in death. It is impossible for you to sin, for me to sin, and to have our sins go unpunished because God is a just God. Now, here's what I mean, to give a picture to what what I'm saying. Imagine that you get a phone call. Imagine you get a phone call in the day and you're, you're told that, that someone you love, I just want you to think about the person that you love the most. Some of you are like, well, I like my kids and my wife. Yeah, I, pick, pick one, okay? Someone that you love the, the most. You get a call and you're told it's the police and you are told that they have been found murdered. You're told that they have, that they have been, been killed, that they were dropped, so they found their body, and, and you need to come identify this. After a lengthy investigation and a subsequent police chase, they capture this killer. They capture this person who has committed a crime against you. And throughout the trial, the, the prosecution presents evidence, video evidence. They, you can see it. It's clear. It's this person that did this to the one that I love. It's irrefutable. The, the, fe- the defense has absolutely no answers. He's guilty. This man is guilty. It is clear. The verdict is going to come down. You know at the sentencing, this man, he should die for his crime. He should die. You want justice to be done, and it's about to be done. You can feel it. You know it. And the day comes, and the judge sits in his chair, and he looks at the man who killed your loved one, and he says, I've considered the evidence. I've looked at it. It is clear. You are guilty. You are guilty, and justice should be done. And in tears, you sit down. You know, okay, justice is about to be served. I can't wait for the the sentencing. What is going to happen to this person? And the judge says, here's what's going to happen. I, I actually think that, that there will be no punishment for this person because there, there's, I'm just feeling gracious and so no punishment at all. No one's going to pay for the crime. There's no punishment. I'm just going to let this person go. You're free to go and he's, oh, <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Waves to the courtroom and, and he walks out the doors and you sit there and you think, wait a second, where's, where's the justice? The, there is no justice in that. Hang on. This judge is totally unjust. This is unfair. Somebody has to pay for the crime. He can't, that person just can't go free. You see, in that moment, There is an accusation, a right accusation, against that judge of being an unjust judge. Justice was not served. And that can't happen with God. It is impossible for him to be unjust. Whatever God does must end with his character of righteousness and justice being upheld in everything he does. And here's our dilemma. You have sinned against him, and so have I, and we have fallen short of his glory, and therefore justice means that our sins must be punished. They must be paid for. And we see in chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. The punishment of sin is death. And there's nothing we can do to get ourselves out of this mess. Verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20 says, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. There's nothing we can do to justify ourselves, to get us out of this mess. And the punishment for our sinning, our falling short of his glory, must be death because the wages of sin is death. You see our problem? It is a sober and 
dire situation that we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in just in and of ourselves. To this point in the story, we are, we are hopeless, rightfully guilty. There looks to be no way out. If you think about it, the doors have been barred. The chains have been fastened. The noose is being tightened. The light is now fading. And hope seems lost because justice must be done. That is where we are in the storyline. But in this story, the darkness of fading hope only serves as a backdrop for the overwhelming light that is about to break through. You see, it is a, it is a backdrop to paint the, the picture on of glory. This sober reminder that we are all falling short of the glory of God and therefore rightfully condemned helps us to see the glory of this spectacular revelation in the following verse. When all seems lost, a hero emerges. Second point is a spectacular revelation. We, we find that there is a giver. We find that there's a giver who comes with a gift that if we accept it will remove the noose from our necks, break the shackles that hold us fast bound to death, unlock the doors that will lead to new life and new hope. Yes, it's true that we have all sinned, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But look at verse 24. There is no distinction. Everyone is justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Listen to this with, with fresh ears, with the backdrop of hopelessness. In our hopelessness, in our inability to save ourselves, God himself appears, listen, not to destroy us, but to show us mercy. This, this is a gift of grace. And it is amazing grace. Justification by his grace as a gift. The gift of grace offers us pardon for our sins. It allows us to be justified in the sight of God by grace. It is a gift to be received with joy, with gladness, with eagerness, because we who are once hopeless and enemies of God have been given a new hope. And this gift of grace has nothing to do with our working. We can't work for it. It has nothing to do with our ongoing righteousness and our perfect obedience. It is a free gift of grace by God. God to us that pardons us from our sins and declares us to be righteous. It is free. Kind of. Kind of. There's a little bit of a catch because gifts are free to the recipients. But gifts aren't free to the givers. You see, gifts are free to those who, who get the gift we receive it with joy, but it, it's not always free to the one who is giving the gift. Our joy, our gladness, the awe that we should feel should even be greater once we understand and realize the currency with which this gift was purchased for us. You see, God is still just. He, he can offer the gift, but he's still just. And the wages of sin is still death. Th those two things haven't changed. God doesn't suspend those truths for this moment. He's still just. The wages of sin is still death. And so for this gift to truly make us free, someone had to die. And so the story of redemption becomes clear. The, the greatest story ever told, the, the true story of redemption about the hero is about a hero who was born to die for you and for me. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood 
to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, God looked at us and knowing that we couldn't do anything on our own to avoid death for our sins, he offers his son to bear the penalty of our sin to be what he says here in this, these verses, our propitiation. Now, if you don't know what that word means, propitiation, let me define it for you because it is an important word in the Bible. It is a wrath-bearing sacrifice that fully exhausts the wrath of God and turns that wrath instead into favor. Propitiation, a wrath-bearing sacrifice that fully exhausts the wrath of God and turns that wrath instead into favor. Jesus became our wrath-bearing sacrifice so that the wrath of God was poured out on him and not on you. Or me. And because of that sacrifice on the cross, we can now experience God's favor forever instead of his wrath. It is a loaded word, it's an important word. Jesus became a wrath bearer and a favor producer. Bears the wrath of God, produces favor for us. And it's only through his sacrifice as our propitiation that we find ourselves justified by his grace as a gift. And because God sent Jesus to pay for our sins, he, listen, because God sent Jesus to pay for our sins, he has become both just because he upholds that reality of he must be just, the wages of sin is death, he is just, and he is the justifier, the one who says you have favor. He punishes our sin on Christ, and he says you may go free. He is both just and the justifier of those of us who believe. The one whom we needed to be saved from has become our Savior. And it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus as our propitiation that we find ourselves justified by his grace. And because God sent Jesus to pay for our sins, he has proved himself to be just. And he has proved himself to be our Savior, the one who justifies us. That is good news. You see, this was, this was necessary if God was to be just. Otherwise, all of us would just be condemned to death. That'd be our lot, but no, he, he has given us grace. And note that this propitiatory work is effectual not just for us living in 2016. It is effectual for every saint who has ever lived, for Elijah and for Jeremiah and for Abraham and for Sarah and for Ruth and for David. You go through the list, every single saint, and all the saints live between Martin Luther and John Calvin and and John Wesley and every single Christian through the ages who has believed and put their faith in Jesus is justified by Christ because God in his forbearance and his patience, it says he passed over former sins. He didn't pass over them forever. He passed over them until the time when the atoning work of Christ was done, in which case all of their sins have been paid for. That is a lot of Think about the power in the blood of Christ to save every saint, and not just us, but those that will come after us as well. You see, in this greatest of stories, there is only one hero. There is only one person who is worthy of worship, and that is God himself, namely the person of Jesus Christ. Redemption Hill Church in Round Rock, Texas. If you trust in the finished work of Jesus for your sins, then you are justified in his sight. You are justified this morning, and that is good news. To be justified is courtroom language. It is, it is being handed a favorable verdict. And once that verdict is rendered, there is no double jeopardy where we can go back and say, you know what, you've sinned so much since I paid for that the first time. You're going to need to have this happen again because it's so much. 
No, there is no double jeopardy. That's on the cross. Jesus said it is finished, and it is finished for you if you trust in Christ. God boldly declares those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus' death to pay for our sins. He has called us righteous. Listen, it's not just that we have been forgiven of our sins and we're declared not guilty. That is true. But it's not just that he said, you know, you have so much debt to pay. Let me just pay it until you get a zero balance and now we're done. No, that is, that is not the end of the matter. He also declares us righteous, which is bringing our bank account to overflowing. Never can be exhausted no matter what we do. As long as Christ lives, we will be righteous. As the, as the late author Jerry Bridges says, it's as if we've never sinned and as if we've always obeyed. That is a gift of grace. Paid for by the blood of Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel this morning. And Christian, in those moments when you're tempted to despair, which we all have those moments, in those moments when you're tempted to despair because of your sin, and your sin seems so great, and you wonder if God could ever accept you, think about the story of Jesus and his working on your behalf. You, you need to find yourself in the Bible storyline and you rest once again in his finished work for you. He paid your debt and the just and righteous God has sent him to do exactly that for you. For while you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. Christian, in those moments when you wonder if God loves you, remember that your greatest need has been taken care of by him. He paid your debts. He intervened on your behalf, sending his son to bear the wrath that you deserve so that you might be shown mercy and favor by him forever. For it is written, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4.10. And Christian, in those moments when you are lulled to sleep by the world or slumbering in apathy toward God, those moments where you feel like, I just don't, I just, the world seems so tempting and God seems like it's, I don't even know if I want to even go there anymore. Those moments when you are tempted that way, may he awaken your heart to his goodness and his kindness and rekindle the flame of his mighty work for you. And may he shine once again in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Let our hearts awaken to the goodness of the gospel again. And let me say a word uh, uh, to, to those of you who would have historically called yourselves Christians. You know, we, we are in, uh, I guess, technically the Bible Belt. <laughs> I think everybody's a Christian here, by name, at least many people are. Maybe you would historically say you are a Christian, but when you look at your life and your patterns of sin and the lack of care or concern for sin or for the Bible or for God or for any of these things, perhaps you've just questioned and just thought, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have ever really believed this. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I believe it now. Maybe you're just wondering. Let me just say, trust in the finished work of Christ. Maybe you're not. Do you believe Christ died for your sins? Perhaps you're like the man in the parable of the sower who it just looks really good. You feel like, yeah, I believed this, but now you're just, this just gone away. I'll just say, turn from your sin. Believe in this story, this true story of redemption, this love story of redemption for you. You either bear the own, your own penalty for sin or Jesus does. And maybe you're here and you're, and you're saying, I know I'm not a Christian. I just, I am definitely not a Christian. I just want you to realize this morning that you are still falling short of the glory of God. See, those of us who are Christians, we aren't better than you. There isn't anything we're better than you. 
at all. No, we aren't stronger than you. We aren't less sinful than you. This is the only thing that's taken place. We have simply come to realize that Jesus is our only hope. We trust in the finished work of Christ for us. We know that we can't escape the just wrath of God until we cry out to the Father to look on Jesus and not on us. And let me appeal to you to do the same. And to prove this morning that we aren't any better than you, I want you to notice that God does everything in this text. Everything. In verse 24, he offers us grace as a gift. In verse 25, he puts Jesus forward as our propitiation. In verse 25, he passes over the former sins. In verse 26, he shows his righteousness and justice. In verse 26, he said to be the justifier. What we bring to the table is our own sin and our desire to have Jesus take it. That's all we bring. That's all we've ever brought. You can do the same. And I pray you have ears to hear this morning that God would do a work in you. Listen, there, there is no greater story. There is no greater truth than this. Is there anything that should make our hearts sing more than this? About the one who paid our debt, made our dead hearts come alive in grace. God intervened and did what we couldn't do by offering his son as our savior. We, we ought to live. It, listen, if anybody should have abundance of joy and gladness and gratefulness, it should be us because we didn't deserve any of this. But we, we have it because God is a gracious God. This should be our hope moment by moment. It should be our hope day by day. And may it be so. Let's pray together. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forevermore. That is, how may that be the refrain of our hearts when we think about the story of redemption. Father, we come this morning as those who you know are, are, can be weary, can be tempted to sin, can be faltering in our faith, can wonder if these things can really be true. Jesus, you know you are like us. You know the temptations. You've been tempted in every way, yet without sin. You know what this world does. You, you've, you've lived this life we thank you that you are a, gr a great high peace, priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. We are weak. Help us in our unbelief. Help us to trust you, to trust in the goodness of the truth of the gospel as we go throughout our days. May it inform us. May it bolster us to live lives that give you glory and honor. Would our lives uh, continually be made to look more like you, Jesus? And, and we recognize that, that we, we want to work at that, but ultimately it is, it is your work that does that in us as we work and, and you continue to help us grow. So I pray that this church would go away this morning encouraged from your word, encouraged to open up their Bibles once again over and over and rejoice in the wondrous story that is told. Would you do that, we ask and we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take a second and just make a couple pastoral applications. We always want to respond to God's word. We, we sit and we listen and we focus our attention on it. We try to hear what the preacher is saying. Um, but as I tell my children, and it's true whether you're a child or you're a grandparent, um, we always either grow 
more passionate about God or less passionate about God when we hear God's word. There's no neutral category. We always respond one or the other. So I wanted to just point out a couple of, of categories. You might find yourself in both of these. I know I do in some ways, but one might land on you more than the other. Um, one might be the, the rebel category where sin has been no big deal to you lately. This might be true of you if you're 14. might be true of you if you're 44. It doesn't matter have any age distinction. It's the category that says, what's the big deal? Why can't God just overlook this one little part of my life? And it's important that we appreciate the injustice that would be in God, as Jason so effectively pointed out, how wrong that would be for the host of heaven for God to simply dismiss sin. But sometimes that's how we treat sin. So if that's you, if you're the what's the big deal season right now, this passage, it provides both conviction for that moment and the solution to that moment. It points out the severity of sin and the majesty of the Savior at the same time. You can go to the cross and say, that's how serious this category of sin is. That's how serious it really is. And yet, that's also the solution. So let me encourage you to do that. If you're in that category, if you're if you're going to be honest with yourself, you're in the what's the big deal category right now. You're in that, that sort of rebel view of what's the big deal with sin. Come to this gospel and see the severity of it. Turn it over to Jesus and experience the joy of forgiveness. The, the other category would be the remorseful. And you're tempted to to try to make up for sin by feeling bad about it long enough. If I just feel bad long enough for my mistake as a parent, if I just feel bad enough for this failure in my life, that thing I did, if I feel bad enough for this particular pattern of sin, eventually my bad feelings will make up for what I've done. This passage leaves no room for remorseful atonement. Our remorse is not our Savior. The only one that can save us is Jesus Christ dying on the cross and God transferring His righteousness to our account. So let me encourage you. Exchange your remorse, which is good in one sense, for a confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whether you're in one category or the other, what I, what I want you to do as we sing this next song is to turn your gaze on the finished work of Jesus, the righteousness that comes because of him, the grace of God that comes as a gift to sinners who now stand justified before God. We'll sing a song and then I'll close us and we'll invite anyone who would like a floor for prayer. Let's sing this together. Now, Lord, indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone For nothing good have I
to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat we Declare as a church, Lord, nothing good have we on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. And in him, you are both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ Jesus. We affirm that, we claim that, we renounce all other trust than trust in you. Receive our trust and our worship this morning. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.